Mm-hmm. Okay. I already saw it. Oh, okay. So now we got to share it. All right. Everyone, we're going to get started at 5.05. Uh, my wife, she's going to be the moderator again on today. Um, basically, on every uh, <laughs> every live uh, message in which we have, she's going to be the moderator. Um, so, I'm going to share my yours. Yeah. So, if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, or we would just like to share a complimentary scripture, then... Uh, she will be the one that, you know, uh, responds in the comment section and uh, make me aware of what you have shared with us in the comment section. me to reiterate uh, we're gonna get started at 505 so we got less than three minutes before we take the lid off of the off of the pot and start cooking All right hey, man we gotta start gotta start cooking before we can before we can sit at the dinner table and eat so let's see what the Lord got stirring up in the pot what he has stirring up in the pot. The Most High always got something brewing, even we, when we don't understand what he has brewing in the spiritual realm. He has something going on that we're just going to have to tap into and, and receive divine revelation from the Most High so that, uh, you know, we may be made aware while we walk along this journey that we call life. Working out our soul salvation. Amen. Amen. So, you know, like I say, it ain't always easy uh, having an apostolic or prophetic office of administration, but, uh, you know, this is what I was called to do, and I'll be happy and joyful to allow the Lord to operate through me. And, I always know things are going to get better. It's going to go, it's going to always get better as long as you keep your eyes on the prize. Your eyes stay on Christ, it's going to get better. It's going to get better personally, domestically, locally, uh, nationally, and globally. It's going to get better, okay? Not by man's standards, but only to those who are able to perceive into the spiritual realm. Okay? That means you have a spiritual lens um, to see what the Most High is doing so that you may triumph over the times by which we are living in. And in order to overcome, you're going to need information. You're going to need affirmation and you're going to need information to work out your soul salvation. Amen. So it's just a quick uh, introductory uh, prophetic statement that I'm making. The word says, for salvation is unto those who endure unto the end. Okay? So for your salvation to be sure, you're going to have to endure unto the end. Right? And this is what we're here for to kind of help help you understand and facilitate throughout this life. Because it, it can be difficult. It can be difficult. Some days, uh, I might have to meditate six to ten times per day. Another day may not may not have to meditate no more than two to two to three times on the word of God, but that's something we have to be intentional about doing. You know, that's dedication. Now you say you're motivated to follow Christ, then you have to prove your dedication to the most high and uh Yahweh Shah, aka Jesus Christ, by 
um, studying to show thyself approved. That means the application of the word or the principle of the divine laws uh, to your life and being intentional about learning what you possibly can to navigate through uh, the path by which the Lord has set forth for you to journey on. Okay? Because everybody got a different uh, different path or pathos. All right? That's the stage. That's the trial. That's the strengthening process. That's the fiery furnace that God is taking you through personally and us through corporately as a body. All right? But that's the, like I say, that's the apostle and the prophet's job is to help guide you through the process. Not do it for you, but to guide you the process through the process so you can be strengthened and so that you can have the tools, the resources, and the equipment to overcome. Okay? To overcome. All right. So let's get started. That's a word within itself. We can just shut it down right here. Okay, somebody might have to rewind and play that back. Okay? But um, today's message is going to be the bread of life. I call it the bread of life, um, the test of a major transition, okay? And we know you can't purchase a product without that bread. You're going to need that bread, all right? And prophetic resources, a.k.a. the word of God, is going to be what? The very tool that you use for consumer purchasing power in the kingdom of heaven. I hope somebody caught that. Okay? You're not going to be able to purchase spiritual things without first having the currency that we call the word of God. That bread. That guac. That paper. That's how you purchase um, or that's how you draw from the from the heavenly account what you have, have inherited by sowing seeds of righteousness through uh, Christ Jesus, okay? But you're going to need that word. The word is the key that unlocks the door, all right? You need that word, okay? Amen, amen. We moving, we moving. That's another word. We can shut it down. What you said, like the old preacher, what the old preacher said, man? amen, amen, amen. What are they doing when they say Amen. They're trying to sift through the spiritual. <laughs> but I will say something that came to mind when you were talking about the currency and how you need the word to purchase. Would you say like spiritual? Yes. Things? Wait, I don't want to misquote you. What did you say? Um, spiritual resources have to be acquired or um, purchased by way of the word of truth. That's our spiritual currency. Okay. So the scripture came to my mind. Lay up for yourselves treasure and treasures in heaven. And you can't lay up. Yourself, treasures in heaven without the word. That's it. That's it. So, in order for you to make it through this transition that we call life, you're going to need the word. The word, according, according to that which is written in the scripture, is called the bread of life. Okay? The bread of life. All right? You have to think about this, too. How did Christ purchase, um, purchase your soul? From the hand of the enemy, he exemplified this in the uh, in the wilderness in Luke chapter four when he was being uh, when he was led into the wilderness by the spirit to be tested by Satan. What did he use as a tool as a resource to overcome um, the enemy? The word. He used the word. He used the word. All right, because you know you cannot overcome a spirit or a a a. Uh, supernatural dimensional being without utilizing the word the word is the holy law okay or aka the divine law or spiritual law spirits or demons even angels only respond to the law of the lord you can't even communicate with them unless you got that law in your heart unless you're subscribing to the law of the lord unless you're committed to observing the commandments of the most high that's the only way to overcome a supernatural being. You have to have a knowledge of the law and you have to have understanding of the law. And we're about to prove it right now, but I kind of want to lay that foundation real quick because 
oftentimes we, we want the ministers to go directly in talking about the transition and making us feel good, but they don't equip you to make it through the transition. The only way for you to make it through the trans transition is to put on the what? Full armor of God. And that is the word. Okay? That's found in Ephesians chapter 6, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6. Do you mind uh, getting Verifying? Ephesians? Yeah. Can you just find Yeah. That's we don't need number one phone. But she's getting Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, she's going to get the, uh, the precept for that. And I'm going to prove that the full arm of God is the word of God. All right? Let's see. Let's see. Go go down. Go down to. There we go. Uh, so we're going to start at verse 11. That's Ephesians chapter 6. Verse. Uh, let's start at verse 10. Okay? It says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So let's find out what the power of God is. So it goes on to verse 11, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's funny that he said that because in another scripture, and we're just going to verify by stating it, it is written. And another scripture, it says, What? For this reason, the word became manifest in the flesh in order to what? Do away with the works of the evil one or the devil or Satan or the flesh. Okay, so the word, listen to what I'm saying, the word became manifest in the flesh. So that's telling you right there, only the word can overcome the evil one, where it says that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So the whole arm of God is the putting on of the word. So you can become like Christ. Therefore, you have to become like the word to overcome the enemy who hates the word. Okay? So it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How are you going to overcome the ruling powers of the earth and their irrational decision making? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 just told you, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world. Those are the ones who sit in seats of power presidency, uh, ruling officials, uh, on it to the military, and those who uh, operate operate behind closed doors who are pulling the string, they're being ruled over by spirits, okay? Demonic entities, demonic entities. That's who they're being ruled over by, all right? It says against spiritual wickedness, see? Spiritual wickedness, not physical wickedness, spiritual wickedness in high places, Okay? Verse 13 says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God, see it repeats itself, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand on what? The word of God. That's your foundation. The word of God is your foundation. Okay? Uh, so the word of God is the commandment of God. So, so it's God's commandments, his laws, and his statutes by which we're supposed to observe, to do, and stand upon. That's why the, God says stand on his promises the promises of god is found in the word of god you can observe that in deuteronomy chapter what 28 where there are blessings for obedience okay what type of blessings god made you some promises according to his word if you keep his commandments okay so it says it goes on to say in verse 14 it says stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth now my wife favorite scripture she knows where i'm going with this and i'm let her say it uh, it says, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. What is truth, baby, according to the word? The word. The word. Um, you want me to quote it? Yeah. Um, I, I got to learn out, figure out like where it is exactly. What is the end there? I, well, I got to memorize it. But it was when Christ was praying to the Father for his disciples. He said, sanctify them in thy truth and your word is truth. That's it. Sanctify them in thy truth. Sanctify means cleanse, purge, purify, make whole, make holy, set apart. For thy word is truth. I see you there. Yeah. Give me one second. I'm almost done. And it says in heaven, in verse 14, it says in heaven on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. So in order to be in right standards with the Most High Elohim, then you got to be fully committed to keeping his commandments through the power of the Spirit that grace may abound in you. 
That's it. You got to at least attempt to keep the commandments of the Most High. All right? To observe, to do, and to teach yourself and to teach your children. Okay? Goes on to say, uh, we're almost done. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See? That tell you right there. The full armor of the Most High Elohim is the gospel of peace. What is the gospel? The gospel is the truth. When he say teach the gospel, he's telling you to teach the truth. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. That's the truth. Only the truth should make you free. So the gospel is the truth. If you're teaching anything other than the gospel, then you're teaching the doctrines of what? Devils. Of devils. Okay, go ahead, babe. Oh, yes. no. But I guess, okay, I will say this. So the gospel, you're saying that's teaching the truth. So it's not just teaching Jesus paid it all. It's like bringing the additional information like, okay, how are you supposed to be living now, you know, and basically just warn against the whole once they've always saved doctrine, just not teaching half truths because teaching half truths is really a lie. That's it. So we have to use that very truth to slay ourselves in the spirit. When we enter into a mindset of falsehood and the spirit of error attempts to take control of our souls, then we have to use the commandments of the Most High, which is the word of truth, to slay ourselves. That means to cut ourselves, to make a surgical incision so that God may be, begin to operate on us through the power of his spirit. Let's find out uh, what the weapon of the Holy Spirit is. Okay? Let's see. It should be. Yep. Um, so um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse um, 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, okay, we know how do you attain faith? Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Okay, the word of God is the truth. Okay, or the commandments of the Most High. All right, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You cannot quench the fiery darts of the wicked unless you are upholding the truth or the standard of the Most High, which is keeping His commandments. He said, "If you love me, keep my commandments." So let's find out what the what the sword of the spirit is or the weapon of the spirit. Verse 17 says, and take the helmet of salvation. All right, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's the sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. See, we can break this thing down and I, and I enjoy it. True prophecy comes from the testimony of Christ. That's what the spirit of prophecy is, the testimony of Christ, the law of the Lord. What did Christ testify of when he came, to, came here to the earth realm? Prophetic fulfillment according to the commandments of the Most High. He was being obedient to the commandments of his heavenly father. His heavenly father gave, gave him some instructions in, um, in the Torah, which is the what? The law of Moses and also in, in the writings of the prophets. He had to fulfill the law and the prophets. That's what he had to do. So, God, see, God sent his only begotten son um, to be an example of prophetic fulfillment of how to walk out your soul's salvation by keeping his holy commandments. That's it. That's exactly what it is. Okay? Okay, if you guys have any questions, please please ask in the comments below or uh, for those who may be just tuning in after we get off the live. You can still uh, make comments and then we'll, we'll return back to the comment section later on and we will uh, you know, answer those questions to the best of our abilities and hopefully according to scripture. Okay, We should have a complimentary scripture or precept. All right, so we're going to move on. Now, the interesting thing is uh, in order to make it through a major transitional test, you're gonna have you you're gonna need to know the answers to the test. What's the answer to the test? Whatever the teacher taught you, all the concepts, all the terms, everything they have to walk you through, um, all the assignments that we, that you were issued before the major test uh, test day came. For you to feel that pressure and that torque of passing the test. Because generally, a test is at least 20 to 25% of your, your overall grade in the academic arena. 
okay? What is the standardized test? Nine weeks test. It's 20 to 25 percent of your overall grade. And when that test comes, it's more pressure because you know that. If I don't pass this test, especially if you're already sitting on a, on a C or a D, if I don't pass this test, then I'm going to fail the class. So now you got to study a little harder. You got to focus. You got to be prepared. That's the test. And the teacher can't help you on the test because we all have our own personal test that God takes us through spiritually. So if we desire to make it to another level in Christ or to get closer to the Most High, then we have to pass the test. What's the test? Overcoming. Overcoming the obstacles in your life. That's the test. That's your life path. Okay? You have to be able to endure throughout the transition. Okay? It's something I wrote down here earlier. Uh says, there, there isn't a curse that that uh, is conjured against you that can hold you bound if you believe that you have obtained freedom through the spirit of grace and truth. For it is written, if you believe, you shall receive if you act according to my will. And beyond that, if you strive to obey God's what? Commandments. That's how you overcome. The word says, when we overcome what? Evil with good. According to the word, what is good? That which is good is considered to be the commandments of the Most High. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, and his mercy shall endure unto all generations. How do we know if God, if God is good? What is he telling us to taste and see? He says, if you try to what? Abide by my commandments. If you try to live by my instructions, then you're going to realize that it was good for you. It was good for you. Uh, the prophets, both, uh, I, I was reading Ezekiel and in uh, the book of Revelation when John was you know, on Patmos, uh, when, the, when, when the Lord came to them, he told them to eat the scroll. He told Ezekiel to eat the roll, which is actually a scroll, and he told what? John in the book of Revelation to eat the scroll. What did they say once they ate the scroll? They say it is what? Bitter. Well, sweet. Sweet. Yeah. In your mouth. The problem is when it hits your digestive system, it becomes bitter. Bitter. That's it. That is so totally true. It's like you can be going through something and you read that word and it's just so good and tasteful. But once you gotta actually apply it and to your life, digest it into your life, it's like That's it. This is tough. This is I'm I'm low key bitter. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Cause I like what she what she said. Because when the body, when the body begins to uh, do a biochemical breakdown of what of the nutrients that you just consume, it's so that those nutrients that you just consume can become a part of you. So guess what? What some what depending on what you eat. Sometimes if you eat something that's a little bit tougher to digest, it's going to make you sluggish. It's going to make you moody for a time. Because it's something new that's becoming a part of you that you weren't originally accustomed to. So that's the digestive uh, digestive process. And we know that a process is also a transition. Something is becoming a part of you that you're not accustomed to. So it's going to make you feel uncomfortable. No one wants to take a test. We're ready to teach it. Just exempt us. Even the A students like, I shouldn't have to take this test. In my last class, my teacher exempted me. That because that might not have been a major class. But see, this is a major class right here. Being a disciple of Christ is a major class. It requires discipline. So if you're the A student that you say that you are, it should be a problem for, for you to remember the material on the test and pass it. But it depends on your mindset. If you go to the Lord and say, you can't make me take this test, then you already have a defeated mind. But... If, you, if you're confident that you're going to pass the test, then you're looking forward to applying those answers to the paper, handing them to what? Handing them to your teacher so, you can, uh, so the teacher can immediately grade your paper and you can get that A+. Plus. A good student wants the teacher to, to, to grade their paper right then because they know they didn't pass. Yeah, go on grade it. I've been studying for this test for two weeks. 
I know I'm gonna pass that. Even if I get one wrong, I'm still gonna make an A plus. See how the Lord mess with you in the spirit? You know. All right. So it's um something I uh wanted to share with you guys. Um Deuteronomy chapter eight, uh, verse one through three. Okay. So I'm gonna read this. It says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live. And just to give you a little back background information on Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, this is what Moses had to uh, had to encourage the, the children of Israel um, in the wilderness. He had to encourage, encourage them and remind them that uh, uh, of the things that God had already brought them through because they had started murmuring and complaining. They was already murmuring and complaining. So he had to remind them of what God already did for them. If he brought them through before, he can bring them through again. But he was very explicit in the information that he relayed unto them. Because you know how our people can be Israel. They can be stubborn and stiff-necked and pretend like the Lord hasn't done anything for them because of one situation that's um, applying new pressure to their life. So you can have faith. Uh, you can have faith in one season because it's easy. But what happens if the next season in your life is a little bit harder? What are you going to do then? All you can do is keep the faith and persevere and try to stay with the Lord. Try to apply his commandments to your heart. Try to encourage yourself. How do you encourage yourself in the faith? How do you hold on to your faith? Well, we said earlier that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the word is supposed to increase your faith while you're going through your transition. So even when Satan is sent forth by the Most High to test you, to, to test your resolve, then you will have the weapon of the spirit to be able to combat against the enemy. But if you're not studying in times of peace, how are you going to overcome in times of war? That's why wisdom is the principal thing. The word says, therefore, what? Get wisdom and all thy getting, get understanding. You have something? About Isn't there a scripture that say, be ready in season and out of season? That's it. So that just reminds me of you saying, like, you know, you need to be studying in times of peace. You know, sometimes you'd be like, Lord, everything's going good. You know, so it's like, don't get too comfortable. You need to be pump, getting pumped up off that word. So when the tough times do come, and as you all, you're, you know, you always talk about things are sick cyclical you know things come back around it's seasons so this it can you can you get that scripture for me okay. um um in season out of season this see this is my wife right here we connected <laughs> uh the lord just shared that revelation to me then we're going to get right back to deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 1 through 3 but she's going to find where it says be ready in season and out of season because i want to break something down to my brothers and sisters in christ real quick Okay, that's it. Can you read that for me, baby? It's Second Timothy chapter four, verse two. It says, "Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine." What type of doctrine? Truth, sound doctrine. Sound doctrine, truth, good doctrine. Okay, what's the doctrine that they're talking about? Keeping God's what? Commandment. Teaching God's what? Commandment. All right, so that's what it is. When they say preach the word, it means preach, um, teach God's people the what? His commandments so that they may live and not die. Okay, it says be instant in season. That means everything else can change. The rhema word that y'all like to hear from the preacher all the time, you're going to get a house, you're going to get a car, you're going to get a, you're going to get a candlestick, you're going to get a jar. You see what I'm saying? You're going to see near. You're going to see afar. We like all the nursery rhymes and the stories uh, to be told to us. The fables like the word talk about. We love to hear fables. We like to hear parables. All of those type of things. Even proverbs. But guess what? This word right here is supposed to be preached in season and out of season. And the word that God's talking about in 2 Timothy 4 and 2 is his commandments. Because the commandments are universal. Seasons may change, but the word of God shall remain what? The same. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? God's word shall remain forever and ever, a.k.a. for all eternity. 
The word is not going anywhere. The commandments are not going anywhere. Because we keep forgetting the commandments of the Most High are actually cosmic laws, spiritual laws, divine laws. So the word calls it what? The royal law. God is a king. That's his law forever. And in terms of seasons, you know how, you know, we talked about how seasons change, but you still have to be instant in prayer and reading your word and preaching the word. Um, it's a scripture that says, like, the grass withereth and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So the flower can, and the grass can be out during the summertime, but once it's winter, those cold months, the seasons change. No matter what the season is, God's word is still going to be there. That's it. His word is absolute. It cannot be altered. It cannot be changed. It cannot be fabricated. Scripture says that the, the truth shall stand alone. Okay? Don't add nothing to it. Don't take nothing away. For the prophecies that are written in this what? This book. Okay? Christ came said in the, in, the, in the volume of the book as it is written of him. He's the word. The volume means the whole book. The 66, uh, 66 books that's in the King James Version and also the books that they took out of the Bible. He said the whole book. That's what he's saying. The volume, um, the volume of the book as it is written. Not as what we feel how we think, but how it is written. Okay? From day one, God gave, established his commandments through Adam. From day one, he was teaching God's, I mean, he was teaching um, Adam his commandments. So if he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, that means that what? God is going to teach his commandments even today. When all hell break loose, his commandments still going to be absolute. And our actions are going to be weighed against the commandments of the Most High. But if you don't know God's commandments or what he's asking of you as his chosen elect or his children, then you're going to continue to sin. See, the commandments of the Most High that tells you, that says, thou should not what? Lie, thou should not steal. Uh, uh, thou should not cover another man's wife. Thou should not bear, bear false witness against thy brethren. When it says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. When it says, love thy neighbor as you love thyself. For love is the fulfillment of what? Of the law. These type of things right here is, is what convicts us of our sins. Okay? So the scripture we just gave you says that what? It was to rebuke and to reprove. That's what God's word is here for, to rebuke and to reprove. That's the sword of the spirit. So when you say, well, I got the spirit of the most high on the inside of me. Well, the Lord gave you his spirit to rebuke and to reprove you of all your transgressions. What is the, what is a, a transgression? A transgression is a sin. The word say for sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. Okay. Um, I want to share um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. It says, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. So I brought this scripture up um, because, you know, you was like, you know, the law helped one make with their, their decision making, right? Shit. So in my master's program, you know, I talk about this scripture, he broke it down. I think it was like, um, you know, um, happy, he, the Hebrew origin of the word, um, I will put my laws into their hearts. Hearts in this context means the seat of one's volition, like the seat of their decision making and their will. So it's like you gotta, we gotta have God's law. Like he, he put it, like it's there, but we have to read it to just, you know, to help us in our decision making. Because the seat of our volition is out of, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Seat of our volition is the, the seat of, our decision making, basically. See, and uh, based off the context of the scripture, you can actually make reference to Hebrews chapter chapter eight, and I advise you to read the whole the whole chapter. But uh, yeah, we're supposed to chasten ourselves and put every every sin and every transgression into subjection by the Spirit of Truth right now, because that's called self discipline. 
overcoming the self, overcoming the flesh. The words say walk in the spirit and not in order not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So Hebrews chapter 10 through 16, when my wife just read, read to you, says, this is the covenant that I, I will make with them after those days. What days is he talking about? After you go through hard trial and tribulation. See, the words say, for many are chose, I mean, many are called, but few are chosen. So you got to go through a process to see if you're going, if you're going to be elected by the most high for him to make you into a judge and a lawgiver. Right now, we are going through the motions. He's trying to see who's going to uphold the standard right now in this life. So, so I'm sorry, my bad. Okay, just, just hold it. I'm gonna okay. So when he gets ready to establish his kingdom, when he comes back, remember the kingdom is is spiritual, but at the same at the same time, um, Christ is going to reveal himself to everyone to the, everyone to the four corners of the earth. Okay. So what he's trying to establish right now is who's going to make it through this process, who's going to make it through this transition, who's going to love the law of the Lord right now even though he hasn't fully established his laws in our hearts, okay? So this is an event to come. Even though he's given us this, the Holy Spirit, our mind still has to be renewed day by day. But once we receive our, and I know they're going to love this, once we receive our, our um, what is it, celestial bodies, trans, being transformed in the twinkling of the eye, like Paul said, that means you're going to get that glorified body. Then the Lord is going to place his law in the hearts of those in whom he has elected to serve under him. So they can teach the people. This is what this is. So we make we can make a, a reference point all the way back to, uh, let's see, uh, Malachi. Okay, the book of Malachi is to what? The Levit Levitical priesthood. The Le Levitical priesthood, their responsibility was to teach the law, a.k.a. the Torah, or the commandments of the Most High, to the Israelites. That's it. So that was their responsibility. So God is trying to, basically what I'm trying to say is, he's trying to see who's going to be prepared to receive their inheritance when he comes back. Because everybody's not going to have the same portion or the same inheritance. Everybody's going to have their own unique responsibilities. And one thing, being a teacher, according to the word, as this, uh, I think, I think it might be in Peter or something, but as the apostles say, it's hard because you're going to be held accountable for teaching. He said, uh, the, the, the apostle said, I would de desire at night that you would become a what? A teacher. I would desire not, but I still encourage everybody to at least observe to do the commandments. So you can make, still make it through these hard trials and tribulations, and you can enter into eternal life. Okay? You had a question? No, you answered it. I did? Mm -hmm. Okay, it must have been the spirit there. The spirit, you know, when I go on the road, spirit just speak. But yeah, these things that we definitely need uh, 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 you know, a response to so we can, uh, we can, we can know. Just like um, the covenant, which we call the new covenant, a.k.a. the renewed covenant. God is going to make all things what? New. He's going to make all things new. Okay? We're going to have what we call a new heaven and a new earth. That means a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. All right? Just like you renew something that has been damaged, like a car or something. It's the same car, but it's just going to be renewed or restored. Okay, so the covenant is about to be restored back to God's people so that they can teach the inhabitants of the earth his holy law so everything can come back into peace and harmony under the most high. You have some? Um, so just to verify, uh, well, clarify rather, Hebrews 10 and 16, because I think when I was going over this, you... I think you kind of clarified something for me then so obviously i believe that i kind of reverted back to my original thought process in this so hebrews 10 16 that's more futuristic than it is now that that's not this doesn't apply to right now no nah, due to the the context of, of the scripture go to hebrews chapter 8 and 8 real quick and i'm gonna explain use the scripture to explain it on what uh the, the new covenant is, which you can also verify in, in uh in the book of Jeremiah too. 
So when he said, I'm, I will make a new covenant, it's not this new covenant, which is the was in the New Testament, but I understand you told me that it's a renewed covenant, even though they, you know. Yeah. The world calls it the new covenant. Yeah, the world calls it the new covenant, but. Is it in the New Testament, though, the actual words new covenant? Yeah, I'm about to take you take them to it. Go to Hebrews chapter chapter 8, verse 8. I, it didn't. I put it on there just then. Go ahead. You might have to go to a another thing. Okay. See, this is the hard part of a teacher right here. We got <laughs> sometimes, man, the old educational system screwed a lot of people up and they got to relearn, relearn lessons and the and the Holy Spirit got to help us help us out with this. All right. Um okay, yeah. So Hebrews eight and eight. Can you read that for me? For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay. With the house of who? Israel. And the house of who? Judah. So that's what he means, new covenant. Okay. Uh, man instituted or honed the term or concept of the New Testament. That's not biblical. The New Testament is not biblical. There's only one testimony. That testimony is the testimony of Christ, which is the word of God. And that can be proven with scriptures too. So uh, that's what we call a man-made ideology. See, we roll with it when we unlearn, but then when the Lord teach us that discipline and he cleanses us up through one of his holy teachers, then we got to, we got to frame my mind around allowing God to um, reprogram us according to the original way. Okay, why are we why are we so messed up worldwide? Because we've been enslaved, we've been persecuted, we've been oppressed. So, I mean, it's stuff we're supposed to be teaching. Our, when we learn, we can teach our children the truth according to the Word of God. But uh, if me and my wife have to, we'll re revisit this concept right here, and uh, we'll go through Hebrews chapter uh, chapter eight. Uh, I use Jeremiah to verify what the new covenant is who it pertaineth unto, and all that type of stuff, like that. So, <clears throat> but right now we're dealing with the transition, the transition of God's people and what he's trying to bring us into. What is he trying to teach us through this transition? So when Christ returns in our lifetime, okay, because we're all having dreams and visions, there's something apocalyptic, a supernatural is going to occur in our lifetime. All the signs, it's happening around us worldwide. They're, they're even about to change the world's currency. The currency system right now. And if you know anything about economics, the dollar, the dollar, the value of the dollar has diminished. It's decreased. But there's so much stuff happening. Wars, rumors of wars, uh, economic crisis. We just have, we still have the coron coronavirus. All of this. Some more things are transpiring right on our people losing their houses, their car, their car. We got a food shortage right now. Everything that has been prophesied in the Bible is coming to pass in a short time. So we're to observe the times and the seasons and know that when all these things trans transpire, that the end is what? Yeah. Near. Not far off. The end is near. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter eight and one through three. It says, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou would keep his commandments. See, that prove what I'm saying. He's testing us to see if we would at least keep his commandments before he actually put his connect commandments in our hearts, in our mind. Because those commandments are going to become a part of our what? Glorified bodies. That makes sense. Because that seems like it's at a point to where it's involuntary. Yeah. But now it's kind of like one of those things to where he's saying will you voluntarily put his laws. Okay. And it's a struggle. That makes sense. It's a struggle. That's why our minds have to be renewed, what? Day by day, because it's a struggle. Uh, yesterday, you might be on fire for the Lord. That word on your heart, on your tongue, you out there preaching to everybody and their mama. 
Then the next day, all the enemy that hit you. Amen. You get hit and it's like your spiritual growth and development is non-existent. None. So what is he doing? He's what? Conditioning our inner man. He's trying to teach us humility. The word just said what? The Lord, what he said, God led thee um, um, these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee. The word say humble thyself before the what? Lord. Resist Satan and he must flee. If you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. So God is trying you through the fire. He's teaching you how to be humble and not enter into a state of pride. He's trying to prove you to the world that you can what? Withstand the conditions that's going on around you. You can handle the chaos. You can handle the calamities. You can handle uh, uh, the naysayers, the backbiters. You can handle the haters. Those who don't like you. You can handle the scornful. You can handle all the pressures of life. He wants to prove you, prove you as his chosen vessel to the enemy. This one right here, this one going to make it through. Have you considered my servant, Quinn? Have you considered my servant, Shatassi? Have you considered my servants that's watching this, uh, watching our, our live right now? Have you considered them? These are this right. This individual right here is a brand that's plucked from the what? The fire. And through all that, depending on your mindset and your spiritual maturity, God's going to keep you. He's going to keep you in perfect peace for all minds that stay upon him. Okay. And when he says him, he means those who observe to keep his commandments, those who will walk according to his word, those who will be content in his truth. Then the word says, for you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So it ain't the ex external man that's being conditioned because the external man is physical. This is a physical vessel. It's the internal man that's going to receive the glorified body. It's the soul man that's going to receive the glorified body. Who you truly are exists on the inside of this physical vessel. That's what's being conditioned. If you're not humble in your heart, then how are you going to be humble once you receive the glorified body? See, God, God is not... I'm going to continue to preach your word. Are you? What happens when hard times hit you? Are you going to still preach the word of truth? Are you going to encourage yourself in the word? And once you make it through, Peter, are you going to turn back and strengthen your brother? Are you going to turn back and comfort your brethren with the word of God? Are you going to rebuke your brethren when they're wrong? Or are you just going to give up and throw in the towel? God say he's a present help in a time of trouble. You don't need God until you're in trouble. Most people don't even desire God until they're in trouble. See, this stuff we have to think about. And he said, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee. I got to keep going back to the word humble. Humble. God is trying to humble his people. As soon as you think you have it all, you got a relationship with the most high. Most people hold their head up high in pride and they look down on others. He said, no, I got to humble you. Most people think they're greater than God. So he said, no, I got to, I got to humble you because now you're going in the way of Satan. Now you're going in the way of Balaam. You're producing a mindset of pride. You're losing your integrity, your morality. You're not exercising self-control because you're allowing the enemy to the persecutions of the enemy and the world to push you to in a place that's undesirable to the most high. He says to know what was in thine heart. God wants to know what's in your heart. He said these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me that's what he said he said whether thou will keep his commandments or no okay if you got money 
You got houses, you got cars. Most people are not going to keep God's commandments. They're not. Most preachers, are, they, they don't even teach God's commandments when they start becoming millionaires, multi-millionaires. They stop. But good old Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he said he was still teaching, even though he had 700 wives, three, what it was, uh, was it 300 wives, 700 concubines, whatever it was. And if you read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Solomon called himself the preacher. He said throughout all that, he wrote those Proverbs. He said throughout all that, he was still teaching God's commandments. One of my wife's favorite verses, I think, is uh, with Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 through 14. Solomon instructs the people who were reading the book of Ecclesiastes to keep God's commandments. Despite of the lessons I had to learn because I, went, I entered into the way of the wicked, the end result that God desired of me was still to keep his commandments, to uphold his law, to present his statutes to his people. All the money in the world didn't satisfy me. God had to humble me and bring me back to my foundation. God says, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know. God, God will bless you with something that you don't even know. He'll create a miracle in a situation where you think that everything is, is dead. He'll do that for you. But you got to believe. The words say walk by faith and not by sight. They say they didn't even know what manna was. But God still gave it to them to sustain their life in the wilderness. Even though they were disobedient, defiant, he loved them enough. He was long-suffering towards them enough to still bless them with angel food. They didn't even know if their stomach could process that. He still gave it to them, angel food. He said, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. They fathers, their ancestors didn't even know. Abraham didn't even eat angel food. That he might make thee know that man does not live by what? Bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. He was teaching them a lesson. He said, Thou should also consider in thine heart that as a man chasten his son. See, we don't like to be whooped by the Most High. We don't like to be disciplined by the Most High Elohim. We want everything to line up according to how we desire those things to line up. And when it don't suit us well, we go on a temper tantrum. But here's what God says. So the Lord thy God chasteneth thee as a son, as a man chasteneth his son. He said, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. God is telling you, telling some of you to do something right now, this day. He wants you to pray. He wants you to fast. He wants you to commit himself to you. He wants you to repent right now. Are you going to put that off? Or are you going to press pause and go do it? The word said, the day you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your heart. Do it while it is yet what? Day. Some of y'all are wrathful. You're upset. You're bitter. God say do what? Release yourself from that by subjecting yourself to the convictions of the Spirit through my holy commandments. He said, whatever you're hearing right now, present it before the altar. If you have hope with your brother, leave the altar and go back and reconcile to thy brother. Ask for forgiveness. Even if they don't forgive you, that's your responsibility, but do it with sincerity of heart. Be intentional about doing it. The words say forgive, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, uh, <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, that's the bread of life. Uh, uh, forgive us of our, our, our debts as we forgive our debtors. There it is right there. Forgive us of our debts, our sins, our iniquities, our transgressions gracious as we forgive our debtors lead us not into the way of temptation but deliver us from all sin and evil for thou is the kingdom the power and the glory
forever and ever. Amen. Y'all just killed some demons right there. <laughs> he said, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. All right, it goes on down here. Say, Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and has built good houses and dwell therein. He says, Don't forget them. Okay? So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Christ repeats what was already written in Deuteronomy chapter what? Chapter, chapter 8. What did he say? But he answered and said, It is written, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So if Christ verified that he himself had to live according to the word of God and not just by bread alone, and you're supposed to be his disciples or followers of Christ, then what does he what? Desire of you to live according to the word. That's what it is, to live according to the word of the Most High Elohim. And I'm about, I'm about to prove that to somebody who really wants to learn. John chapter 14 and 6 uh, says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye love me, keep my commandments. So Christ said, if you love him, keep his what? Commandments. The same commandments that the Heavenly Father gave unto him. He says, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. So he will love you if, he, if you do what? Keep his commandments. And will manifest himself to you. Okay? So Christ can still manifest himself to you before, uh, before he returns with the, the host of angels. He can still do that. He's a spirit. That's called having a personal relationship with Christ. All right? And you might not understand all the prophecies, but you can have a personal relationship with the Most High, and you can have uh, a personal relationship with Christ Jesus. You can have that. He'll manifest himself to you. He'll give you a dream, a vision, or he might manifest himself to you through his word. He might send a prophet to manifest himself to you. He might even make a donkey talk. That's God. So he's not opposed to visiting visiting you when you're down, when you have when you feel overwhelmed or overcome. He's not opposed to that. He can still do that. Okay? Remember, uh for, for the word, the word says, for God is a spirit. So he's not restricted to the physical laws of man. He say they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what he said. So he said, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. That means his commandments. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He will live in you through hard trials and tribulations. He will live in you. Okay? It says, he that loveth me, loveth me not, keeping not my commandments. That's what he said. If you don't love him, if you don't love him, then you don't keep his commandments. You might even disregard it. You'll say some things like the commandments is done away with. We no longer have to subscribe to the commandments of Christ. That's telling me that it's okay to go out there and sin. It's okay to be an active homosexual. It's okay to sleep with another man's wife. It's okay to steal. It's okay to kill. Because guess what? The commandments done away with. That's what, that's what the false prophets are preaching right now. Don't observe God's commandments. That's what they're saying. That makes no sense to me. So if somebody steal from you, then what? They can say, well, guess what? The commandment's done away with. I can steal from you. There's no penalty. You're going to want justice. So if you're teaching somebody that, then the penalty is going to fall back on you. The blood is going to be required on your hand because you're not teaching God's people to keep his commandments. You're not teaching God's people that homosexuality is bad, sexual immorality is bad, adultery is bad. You're not teaching that. And that's a problem. You're not teaching them that fornication is bad. Sleeping with animals is bad. All that type of stuff is going on. Having these obscene surgical procedures that they don't need to try to look like somebody else is bad. That's negative self-imagery. That goes against the, the, the first two commandments that God, that Christ told you, that all the other commandments hang upon. He said, love thy what? 
neighbor. Neighbor as you love thy self. So if you're making modifications to yourself that you don't need, then that means you don't love yourself. You don't love your inner person and you don't love how you look, your outer, your outer count, countenance. So that's a violation of the commandment right there. But if you would have kept God's commandment, then you would have learned to love yourself. Oh, that's interesting. You know? I say that that's interesting because that means like if they picked their self apart and hated themselves so much so to they have made modifications, then it would make it easier for them to pick other people apart. That's it. You know? So that's not loving them. That's it. Even in high school, the girls that didn't love didn't love themselves, they had a problem with everybody. They had a problem with people, the other girls physically and academically. They'd be mad at you from being an A student. Look at this smart son, so right here. Always got to upstage us in class. Teacher's pet. All that. Just, just be the friend to the girl who's who, who's smart, intelligent, or a genius. She'll help you out. She'll help you out. But when you're stubborn and you self self absorb and you got an inferiority complex or sometimes a superiority complex, then you would not you would not require the help of somebody else. You'd rather fail and torment that person than to work in conjunction with them. You might be able to help that girl uh, make she you might teach her how to dress or something, and you might teach her how to do mathematical equations, scientific equations, formulas. Those type of things. Y'all can still work together. Everybody got their strengths and weaknesses. So there ain't no need to hate on somebody. When you hating on somebody, it's because you don't love yourself. You don't feel like you have enough. You haven't self-identified or self-actualized or self-realized. That's what that is. You don't know yourself. You're too busy doing a comparative analysis with somebody else. Look what she got and what you don't have relative than looking what to looking to what God and already bless you with and how you and this other person can work together. That's where feuds and disputations and quarrels come in. That's a court that's written in James chapter four, verse verse one through two. So this is where we are. Give me James chapter one. Uh change chapter chapter four, verse uh one through two. <clears throat> We got to prove to our, our beautiful brothers and sisters uh, that God still loves them. He's long suffering towards them, but he ain't gonna tolerate sin though. Okay, James chapter four verse uh, one says, "From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members?" See, he didn't say somebody else. He said in your members. So the lust. Uh, what does it say? Uh, yeah, your lust that war in your memories. It's a personal issue. It says, ye lust, that's verse 2, and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. That's it. And verse 3 even says, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. That's powerful. So it's something that worked within our brothers and sisters. Iniquity. Iniquity is at work within us. The word say for all, for what? Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Some scriptures say what? Wax worse and worse. Iniquity is a sin. So sin is just going to continue to increase, continue to increase, continue to increase. Okay? And first of all, we're, we're gravitating towards the wrong things. Most of our women grabbing toward, gravitating towards the women who do, do have the fake lips, the fake butts, and, uh, and the fake breasts, and who have had uh, reconstructive surgery on their waistline. Most of those women weren't even born with those waistlines. But that's something that you desire. And you glorify it. That's carnal. The words say for... <laughs> For to be corner minded is enmity with God. That means that you're going to be in opposition to God. You're going to be his enemy. His law didn't tell you to do that. Now, what you can do, if you want to do uh, natural modifications, uh, you can't eat healthy, drink uh, drink plenty of fluids like water and, and juices, uh, anti antioxidants, probiotics, those type of things. You can do that. 
You can change your lifestyle. You can start exercising, working out, getting your cardio up. You can do that. Do it the right way. Anything that's done too fast is going to have consequences. Like these genetically modified uh, foods. Now, when you raise when you raise chicken too fast, then it's going to be a biochemical imbalance. And if you eat that chicken, like most of us do, without especially without praying over that chicken, then we're going to take we're going to take on the iniquity that or the abuse that was caused to this chicken because it's spiritual. Somewhere somebody violated the spiritual law, and now you're intaking that into your body. That's why we got to keep fasting and praying like that. Somebody broke a law. And praying over your food. Because it's somewhere in the scripture where it talks about like how your food can be made clean if you pray, you know. So yes. some people just diving right in. We say, oh, give thanks unto the Lord. And mm -hmm. That's it. And all things give thanks. That's right. So that canceled out that spiritual law. Right there, you give thanks. And you, you just can't keep... And another thing, our people just keep eating, 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 eating. Every once in a while, you shouldn't be praying over the same food over and over again. Get you some healthy foods every once in a while so you can cleanse your system out. Because praying over the food ain't going to unclog your arteries. That's true. So I'm not saying pray over <laughs> pork chops. Facts. You know, and saying, Lord, bind up any impurities that's within mm -hmm. its food. You know it's unclean. It's impure. That's it. Shouldn't even be eating that stuff no way. Yeah. I don't know why I'm having a heart burn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why my head hurt. You ain't drunk enough water. You got a migraine. You dehydrated. That's what that is. I don't, I don't know why I can't function. You ain't eating nothing but chips and chicken and rotel dip. That's what's killing you. Okay? It ain't even the stress. You putting extra stress on your body when you're not eating healthy. But... That goes back to not keeping God's commandment. So the Lord had to discipline. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, God was taking them through a major transition to discipline them. Because they were undisciplined. They were undisciplined. They came out of Egypt. They worshiped uh, worshiping idols. That's Egyptian gods. They were practicing their ways. They were eating their, eating their food or whatever was handed to them. You know when you enslave when you're in slavery, you gotta eat whatever the you gotta eat the scraps or whatever the slave master gives to you to survive. That's what you have to do. So for generations and generations and generations, that's all they knew. They didn't know anything else. They didn't know anything else. Uh Pharaoh didn't even want them going out worshiping God. They couldn't even worship their, their they couldn't even worship their deity, their God, Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel. So it's the same thing that they're doing over here in the United States of America uh, when they're pushing false religion and, and uh, false Christianity, false Islam, false Judo, Judaism. They don't want you to get the full context or the substance of the word of truth as it is written. They don't want you to get, they don't want you to get that because they don't want you to worship the true God. The one who has elected and called you for. You're his creature. You're his creation. They don't want that. So when they sent us into chattel slave, slavery on the west coast of Africa where we was purchased and we were put on slave ships and, and brought here to uh, to the United States of America and, and other parts of the world, you know, by the, col by the colonizers or the colonials, guess what? They start investing their belief systems in you and you lost touch with who you really are and God is trying to restore you back to yourself. And I know it takes time. That's why we got to continue to hear the word of God. We got to observe his commandments. And we got to do better by our children. If it took generations to mess us up, then it might take generations to clean us up. These are just facts. And we keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off because we're chasing money. We're chasing religion. We're ch chasing worldliness. We're chasing the, the latest fashion trends. We're chasing all these things, but one thing we're not chasing, we're not chasing God. So now God got commission somebody like me or other young people that he's raising up to prepare, uh, pre prepare his chosen elect for his coming. We got to war, persistently war against Satan, uh, war against the flesh. We, we got to continue to establish authority and, uh, in the spirit of obedience, we got to release the spirit of obedience in our household because 
God is trying to get his chosen vessels ready. And if we day, if we take a day off, the body of Christ messed up. You lose. Because most people are not tenacious enough to be persistent in observing God's commandments or they don't have the ability within themselves to resist because they're not practicing what the Spirit of the Lord is telling them to do. This life takes practicality. The same way you was practicing sin and lawlessness, you got to practice the law so it can get in you. You got to practice it. Even when it hurt, you still out there sinning. Even when that man and that woman were doing you wrong, you still met up with them in the hotel to have unprotected sex, which is fornication. So you fought, you fought through the convictions of your spirit then, then you can accept the convictions of your spirit now and do the right thing. That's all it is, is a reversal. You was dedicated to transgressing the law. Now you can be ded dedicated to observing to do the law. Say, just try. Just try to teach your children uh, right from wrong. Not the way that you were taught right from wrong. But according to the word of God. Because your word don't hold that type of weight. God's law does. You got to get back to that. What happened to the grandparents that set their grandchildren down and, and talked to them? Even when their mama was out there in the club, the grandparents were still trying to... Uh, uh, raise, their, raise their grandchildren up in the nurturing and admonition of the Most High Elohim and teaching them what? The truth, the way, the law, teaching them how to pray, teaching them how to fast, teaching them how to believe on God even when you don't have nothing. Because you know what happened to them grandparents? Them grandparents, was they were raised up in a time where they didn't have nothing no way, so they had to have faith. Now these grandparents now, they got everything. So they ain't going to teach you the truth. They're making at least $50,000 a year. But they mamas and their grandparents could barely rub a, rub a nickel together with a penny and make change. They could barely do that. So we forget our roots. That's why I listen to the elders when they, when they talk about uh, how they was raised. They didn't have no, no, uh, no good shoes. They had holes in their pants. Uh, they had to mix and match. When they had to run barefooted through the woods, they didn't know that they were going to get bit by snakes or not. They had to go fetch water from the wells. I remember, I, we suppose that's a called an oral tradition, but God brought them through. Granddaddy, God brought them, gr brought them through. Grandmama, God brought them through. And they raised their children. They barely had, they, was, they stayed in a hole in the wall, a shack. But God brought them through. That's who brought them through. They weren't always good, but they remember that God brought them through. They had more faith than a lot of, a lot of us have these days. Because we were, was what? We're giving everything. We get mad when we can't get the, the, uh, the pair of joys we want, the Air Force Ones we want, the Ugg boots that we want. The Louis, the Prada. They ain't know no Louis and no Prada was. If they did, only the white man had it. They was scraping from the bottom of the barrel. And we got the nerve to not remember that God brought us through all of this. We got the nerve to not remember that we ended up in this state because we refused to keep God's commandments. But we were supposed to be kings, queens, and of a royal priesthood. And we didn't uphold the law that we were teaching others to uphold. So therefore, we entered into a state of hypocrisy. And it was a penalty for it. We got to remember, sin lies at the door and the penalty of sin is death and destruction. War unto those who do not teach God's commandments. That's, a, that's, a, that's, that's written. That word woe means destruction and death unto those who have the law, who have the teachings of the Most High, who know the truth and don't teach them. The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. This is the type of teachings that we need. I don't live a perfect lifestyle, but I'm trying. And the words say for a tree is known by the fruit in which it bears.
God will prove me by my faith in him and by my works. He told me to bear witness. He didn't tell me to, to be perfect by man's definition of perfect. Perfect. He told me to be mature, spiritually mature. Be thou holy as thy Father in heaven is holy. That means set apart, sanctified. Be thou what? Perfect as thy Father in heaven is perfect. God upholds the standard of his law, and he keep his word. He stands on his promises. He's long-suffering. He's mature. He don't get rattled up and shaken up when the enemy comes present false, false information unto him or the enemy try to attack his people. He handles business according to the law. That's what it does. They don't mean he don't get angry, but he's not so consumed by his anger that he loses focus on his creation. That's what spiritual maturity is. Let that mind that is also in Christ be within me. I got to stay focused on my purpose so I can fulfill the plan that God has for me here in the earth realm. So when I leave this earth, God can say what? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. And with that being stated, we're going to close this thing out. Um, I love you guys. Uh, it's light always at the end of the tunnel, but you got to make it to the end. You can't point and say, oh, y'all, it's light at the end of the tumble, the, the tunnel, and then you don't make it there. I see the light, but I still got to persevere to enter into the light. We're striving to enter into God's rest. That's what we are. We talked about what God's rest is on other, other videos. You guys can go back and kind of look at our other videos and, and, and study this thing out for yourself. Study this thing out for yourself. The word says study to show thyself approved in the Lord. For workmen, workmen what? Needed not to be ashamed. Needed not be to be ashamed. Rightfully dividing the word of what? Truth. That's the only doctrine. The word of truth, the law of the Lord, the commandments of the Most High. Proverbs say, Son, keep my commandments and live. live. You know, I'm done. You got something to say, babe? That's it. I don't have anything, but we can close with Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, and he shall bring every work into judgment, whether it be good, secret, or evil thing. That's it. Whether it be good, secret, or evil, he's going to bring it all in to what? Judgment. To judgment. How does God judge? He judges based off his commandments. When the judgment of the Lord are in the earth, meaning the law, the testimony and the commandments of the Most High, then what? The inhabitants thereof shall know righteousness. The inhabitants of the world shall what? Learn, learn righteousness. Righteousness. When we teach in this law, then you can learn. So, Father God, we bless this message right now. We pray, Lord, to proceed forth to accomplish that which is sent out to, to do it will not return unto the void. We thank you, O Lord, for just um, vocalizing your message through us on today. We thank you for helping us to practice temperance. We thank you for cutting us with the word, breaking us to pieces, O oh Lord, destroying witchcraft and sorcery that's at work within us, O oh Father, that has been sent forth by the enemy. We thank you for the challenges that you've given unto us and the obstacles that you have blessed us with to overcome. We're not going to be shacking. I mean, I'm um, shaking, rattled. Or, no, that's right. We're not going to be shacking. Okay. <laughs> Somebody must be shacking. We're not going to be shacking off. I know I bind the spirit of shacking. Sexual morality. Sexual morality. Uh, uh, fornication, uh, sex outside of marriage, uh, a man coming into a woman without the intent to marry her, Father. I bind up on um, sexual perversion, uh, all manner of weakness and evil and unrighteousness. And we thank you, O Lord, for overcoming by the blood. For it's written the word, for we come, we overcome evil by the blood, uh, 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 by the lamb, by the blood, by testimony. For these are those who do not love their lives unto death. And we thank you for your word and your, your majestic splendor. And most importantly, we thank you for the tablets um, that you have 
have um, imprinted upon our heart that have your holy commands upon there. And we love you. In the name of your house, our march that Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. All right, you all. Be blessed.